pursuing the ideal of personal excellence. It's not about being a perfectionist. It's not a goal to be reached, a project to prove anything to anyone or satisfy anyone's expectations. It's not something to unnecessarily stress ourselves about. Mm -hmm. As I imagine it, the pursuit of personal excellence involves a personal resolve to do whatever we are doing the best we can in the moment with a non on openness openness to the possibility of better ways. In pursuing a self-transforming goal, we take a heuristic, self-improvement, time-binding approach. We do what we do to discover what we're doing, to learn about what we're doing, so we can learn from what we're doing how to do better what we're doing. And when things don't go as we expect, we use this as an opportunity to learn something about ourselves, about others, and about the world. If we think of our living as something we are doing, better living involves the following self-fertilizing, self-transforming factors. A well-defined goal, a strong desire to do well, having the proper tools, knowing how to use them properly, effectively, efficiently, and the determination to keep learning. Pursuing the ideal of personal excellence involves a lifelong self-transforming adventure of unbridled curiosity, unceasing inquiry, explorations, discoveries, time-binding development, with corresponding adjustment. In other words, a creative general semantics, conscious time binding, generalized scientific approach to doing our life. I find this quite well put by a general anthropologist and metapsychologist Bernard Lonergan in his book Insight. He wrote, not only then is man capable of aesthetic liberation and artistic creativity, but his first work of art is his own living. And Korzybski, also I consider a general anthropologist and a metapsychologist, offered this. Generally, we do not use our nervous system properly. We have not entirely emerged from a very primitive stage of development in spite of our technical achievements. Among the biggest blocks in our self-transforming adventures are our own words and language habits, the ways we usually think and talk. As our ways of talking with ourselves and others have been established through years of cultural conditioning, educational training, and the institutionalized practices, they are not easily recognized, modified, or abandoned. Changing our language habits through applying general semantics principles could be the most challenging aspect of our self-transforming efforts. So it suits us to recognize the power words will have over us when we do not attend to our way with words. The ways we use words help us become more creative and also more destructive. Words help us order, organize, make sense of our diverse experiences, influences, the choices we make, and words advance or, or retard our development. With words, we also confuse, harass ourselves and others. Words help us share and build our own thoughts, ideas, experiences, and actions, and also those of others within and across generations. Words use us when we hang on to our cherished beliefs, attitudes, prejudices, biases, and assumptions, despite the evidence of new and contrary information. We suppress and retard our self-transforming efforts following a lack of correspondence between our language, representing goings on in our heads, and what our language is about, goings on in the outside world. 
In pursuing the ideal of personal excellence, we can use general semantics principles as semantic supervisors, monitors, interveners, and critical semantic tools to assist us in our self-transforming efforts. Applying consciousness of, consciousness of abstracting, a calculus approach, and other general semantics principles as evaluation standards judging standards and guides, we learn to monitor and critically modify our usual ways of thinking and talking about things. In effect, we identify less. With less identifications, we remove many self-transforming obstacles, many semantic blocks, and provide ourselves with clearer paths for pursuing the ideal of personal excellence. Now I would like to use the drums to illustrate some of what um, you heard Ian Giltress talk about, Mark Giltress talk about the left and right hemispheres. My focus is on the um, interconnectedness, interrelationships, and interdependence between elements in a system. So if we think of our human situation as a system, a multidimensional system of different structures, then each part of that system will affect other parts of the system to some degree. It may take a long time, but what we do in this world has nowhere else to go, so it will do to us. Yeah? If we have two individuals in a family, then as a, Mr. Gilpin, um, yeah? as he mentioned, you have a unity with different parts. So, if one individual does something, it affects the whole system, which will affect the other part. If we have two parties, they are part of a nation. And what one party does affects the whole nation, which will affect the other party, which will also affect the first party. Our thinking and our feeling is part of one system. What we think will affect the system and will affect our feelings. And how we feel about things will affect the system and affect our thinking. So the interdependence and interactions are constantly there. So I'd like to give a little illustration of that with the drums. Yeah? Think of this first rhythm as one party, okay? Now, 
I put the two of them together and I'll emphasize one part so you can hear it and emphasize the other part so you can hear it. But the two parts are always there. Sometimes one is submerged and you don't hear it, you have to really listen. And this brings us to the notion of abstracting because whatever is going on, we select from that. We abstract from that and leave out the other parts. But the other parts is still there and it will create the problems that we later will you know, have to deal with. Okay? So here are the two parts put together. Now did you hear the other part yet? Okay, listen for it. Okay. 